Barry Salis about the current commercial real estate market here in Southern California as we take a no BS look at both sides of the issues driving this market today to find the best solutions going forward. With our man right in the middle, it's Barry Saywitz. Hey, Barry. Hey, good morning, Paul, and good morning to all of our viewers and our listeners out there. If it's Tuesday, I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, we are talking real estate. I'm Barry Saywitz, president of the Saywitz Company, managing partner of Saywitz Properties. And if it's one thing I've learned in my 30 plus years of doing this, it's to try and surround yourself with good people, get good information, make good decisions, uh, stay out of your own way, don't step in number two. Uh, there's a whole long list of things you should be doing, but for right now, I think you should be listening because we are going to talk some real estate. I'm excited about today's show today. Uh, I have Eselfi Taylor, who is on the show with us, uh, who is from uh, Taylor uh, Insurance and Financial Planning Services uh, in the Los Angeles area, and we're going to be talking financial tax strategies, insurance, real estate, maybe some sports, all kinds of good stuff. Eselfi, welcome to the show show. I know that you have your own financial planning and insurance services company based in Pasadena in the Los Angeles area uh, and a longtime resident of uh, Southern California. Um, I want to rewind back to your uh, beginnings and your sports days and how you, uh, I guess, uh, one, where you wound up going to school and then how you ended up back in Los Angeles. So let's let's rewind for a minute if we can. Yeah, sure. Um, it's a couple of years ago. <laughs> I, uh, That's what I say. <laughs> yeah, I, I grew up in, uh, in Southern California, grew up in the Pasadena area, attended a local private school, Maranatha High School. I was a, a four-sport letterman in high school, played a... Uh, football, basketball, baseball, ran track, ended up uh, playing basketball in college, uh, landed in, in Portland, Oregon, Concordia University uh, on a basketball scholarship uh, there and graduated uh, 2000 uh, and uh, had my fill of the rain uh, and, and moved back to LA and started my career in financial services right out of college. And so when you were in school, did you, I mean, did you study finance and financial planning? What was the, was there an epiphany of, hey, this is what uh, I want to do? Yeah, I, I graduated uh, magna cum laude with a degree in business management. Um, although I'd say, you know, 99% of what I do now, I did not learn in school. Um, you know, obviously, I think if you're going to be a, a doctor or a lawyer or a scientist, those are very, you know, uh, exact and precise career paths, right? And, and, and methodologies you need to understand. Business really has no rhyme or reason or rationality behind it. Uh, that's one of the things that I liked that I wasn't boxed in. There wasn't a, you know, one way, if you will, to success. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I, 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 I think the valuable lessons that I took out of school were that of, you know, uh, commitment, you know, learning how to start something, finish something, uh, deal with adversity and, and, uh, and, and making a way. So uh, took those those tools and life lessons and they translated, you know, quite nicely into my into my career. So it seems like you soaked up a lot more in college than I did because my three focuses were eating, sleeping and drinking. And I didn't take much <laughs> away from any of those. I still do that. Yeah. Yeah. So you <laughs> so you come back to Los Angeles, you get involved in the financial and the business world. Uh, today you have your own firm, and um, I guess let's talk about a, a little bit about the different uh, aspects of uh, what you do, because I know it's a bunch of different things that get rolled up into the world of what we will call financial planning. Yeah, yeah. Um, by my last count, I think I own 12 companies now. And uh, uh, when I graduated college, I promised myself I'd never look back at my life one day and say, what if, you know, so I swing away. So I've made it my life's mission to die with memories, not dreams, right? And so, um, uh, you know, my primary focus in the bedrock of, 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 my, uh, of, of my enterprise, if you will, is my financial services company, Taylor Insurance of Financial Services. And to your point, you know, there's a lot of moving parts between insurance, investments, tax, estate planning. Um, so I've, I've, uh, I've, I've seen it all. I've been through it all. I think by my, by my count, I've done something like 30,000 client meetings in my career. So you okay. name the situation. Like, and we're going to try and cover it. Yep. Yeah. And we're going to try and cover all of that in the next 24 yep. minutes that we have. Yep. So, or as much as we can. So l let's break it down in pieces. I mean, it seems like with 12 business entities, you need your own financial and tax planning yeah. um, just right. to, to deal with it, especially as we're talking here right after tax day, right? It's very appropriate. Um, but so on 
uh, on the finan people think of financial planning, they think of, hey, I'm going to invest in stocks or I'm going to, you know, go to EF Hutton or whatever I'm doing. Uh, but it's really a, a lot more than that. And especially if you're dealing with uh, retirement plans, you're dealing with whether it's high net worth individuals or in, in certainly in the Los Angeles area, you have a lot of sports and entertainment figures who come into uh, larger sums of money, some well-deserved and others, they just come into it and then they don't really understand how they're supposed to save or invest or what that means. And and your job really is to help people do that. Yeah, um, I, I, I take what I call a macro perspective as it relates to planning, meaning I'm looking at everything. Um, you know, uh, investments in the stock market are certainly one thing and may very well be an integral part of someone's portfolio, but it's just one of many moving parts, right? It, it doesn't matter if you make 20% one year, if you lose 30% the next, right? And so I, I believe that there are no perfect products. There's no one thing that if people do, they're all set. But I do believe, however, in perfect planning through balance and diversification and having different things going. So when people say, Sylvie, what should I do? Should I buy this insurance? Should I invest in the stock market? Should I buy real estate? Sylvie, what should I do? My answer is, Yes. <laughs> All the above. Right. No, I, and I think the key word yeah. is diversification because uh, the stories that you hear from people of I bought NVIDIA or I bought Microsoft back in the day or Amazon or Tesla or any of the great stories in the stock market, that is not tax planning. That is not financial planning. That is not solid planning. That's that's a piece of a big moving puzzle. And so let's try and dig it, break it down in pieces. I mean, certainly there's the stock market. You could You could invest in individual stocks. You could invest in uh, mutual funds, you could invest in uh, managed funds, uh, all relating to what I'm going to call equities. Um, mm -hmm. But the other side of things uh, certainly is and appropriate for the show is, is real estate, which becomes mm -hmm. a piece of uh, someone's investment strategy, retirement plan, if you will. And, and I'm guessing you have a, a whole plethora of clients that have uh, real estate that they own. And, and how do you deal with them from the, the financial planning standpoint? Yeah, um, you know, it, it's my, my whole thing is preliminarily is getting people really to articulate where they want to be, you know, and, and when do they want to be there. One thing I say a lot is if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it with amazing accuracy. <laughs> so one thing I find is a lot of people have quote unquote stuff. They've got insurance or investments or real estate, but they don't really have a plan. So I try to back it down and go, okay, you're here, you're point A. You want to get to point B, what are the measures that you need to take to get there in the most efficient you know, manner? And so as it relates specifically to real estate, um, I'm guilty as, as, as anyone, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the, the, the son of an immigrant father from Ghana and was told to work hard and graduated college at 22, bought my first house at 23. By 28, I own 15 pieces of property all around the country. I'm a millionaire. But no one told me how to analyze real estate. No one told me how to to uh, to protect myself. And so the downturn in 2008, you know, crushed me, right? Because I had all this equity in my properties, but all my properties were in a poor position from a cash flow perspective, meaning that yeah. my rents weren't covering my mortgages. And I, I had to learn very quickly about, about that. It doesn't matter if your property depreciates 20, 30%, if your rents are sufficient to cover the debt, right? And so these are were hard right. lessons. So a lot of the things that I tell people and the planning that I do are not wrought out of my successes and my genius. It's more so that of my failure and and, and that I've seen of, my, of my, myself and my clients, right? I love the quote, do not judge me for my success, rather judge me for the number of times that I've fallen down and gotten back up, right? So I, I tell people all the time, I'm probably one of the biggest failures you've ever met in your life. I just didn't stay down, right? Yeah. And so, um, but yeah, that's that's very important. So as it relates to, to real estate, looking at it, I look at typically there's two paths and in, in, in whether it's a, an income play that you're buying real estate for supplemental income or you're, you're, it's an appreciation play, but understanding someone's objectives and making sure that the portfolio is structured properly is certainly, certainly key. And, and, you know, to, to apply it to the tax side of things, um, most people don't necessarily buy a piece of property for tax purposes. They buy it because they either get emotional about it or I just want to own some real estate or like you said, oh, I think it's in a good neighborhood or a good location and I think it will go up. And, and you know, long term, if you own a piece of property long enough, it's going to go up. But as you said, 
what I learned in the recession is you don't own the property until you pay it off. The bank owns it. You're just in the middle uh, for the time being. And so you've got to make sure that you're managing cash flow, uh, maintenance, and, and all of those other things. But what I find interesting on the real estate side of things when people come to me and ask about buying real estate is not only is there a cash flow, but there's also a depreciation and an appreciation benefit that you have to factor in. And there's really no way to, to guess what the appreciation will be, but the depreciation itself is real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing I say a lot is, is uh, paying less in taxes is just as good as getting a raise. So one of the, the, the benefits of having real estate is the ability to depreciate it. And whether you, you take the traditional depreciation schedule and, and, and amortize it over 30 plus years, or you do something like a cost segregation study that allows you to accelerate that depreciation and take bigger losses up front, um, you know, really depends on the situation. But, you know, real estate has both, both the appreciation and the depreciation. So you can get some tax advantages while you hold the real estate and its value increases over time. I think mean, land is the only thing God doesn't make more, right? So uh, if you own it, chances are to your point over time, you, you, you'll do well, you'll make money. Yeah. And, and I mean, we've done shows uh, previously on cost segregation and, and the benefits <laughs> of that. And th there's no question that and I get pitched all the time. Hey, buy this. It's going to go up in value. Hey, buy this. Interest rates will come down in the future and you'll make more money. You can refinance or, or buy this and you have a depreciation. And so you, again, have to balance the cash flow and, and the property itself. But there's no question, assuming that you're going to buy it, uh, the after tax number is not the same as the pre-tax number. And I think a lot of people are uh, struggling with that, uh, especially in today's environment when they're looking at buying, whether it's investment property or a home with interest rates so high, the good news with a higher interest rate is you get to write off more interest on your mortgage. But the bad news is your mortgage is higher. I mean, that is a real number at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. so yeah. and I, what I was gonna ask was, is, is so when you're advising people, you know, do you look at the pre-tax versus the post-tax uh, and, and try and talk some sense into people and maybe some deals are better than others? Yeah, I think you certainly have to look at every situation case by case to say, is it a good time to buy real estate? Well, not necessarily. Is it a bad time to buy real estate? Not necessarily. I would say there are certain factors that make this a challenging time. Interest rates are higher, right? So your costs of borrowing and carrying costs are higher. Um, there's, although rates are higher, we haven't seen a really massive drop in prices. They've arguably even gone up in some areas Correct. because there's also very little inventory. And some of that is I own a piece of property. Fine. I could sell it. I guess I can get top dollar, but where am I going? Yeah. Right. Some people are sitting on their, sitting on their property. So I don't, I, again, I don't really subscribe to good or bad. It's just every circumstance is different. Right. And so I think I would always have, you know, my eyes open. One thing I say a lot, you know, I've got four daughters and, you know, they're all athletes and running around and I try to impart as many of the way in life lessons as I can to them. But I tell them, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. So is there a great real estate deal that's going to come up next week? Maybe. So be ready for it and, and maybe not. So I would say have your eyes open um, and, and, and be receptive to things. Um, I always say no what you're saying no to. So you know, you know, look at it. What's the cash flow look like? What's what's the depreciation look like? What does this opportunity look like? You may very well find a desperate seller in this market, and, and even with high interest rates and scarcity, you get a great deal, right? You just have to you just have to uh, you know analyze every situation as it comes. Yeah, and so let's shift gears a little bit to the insurance piece of the puzzle, if you will. And yep. there are many pieces of the insurance piece itself or many slices, if you want to break it down that way. And we've just done a couple of shows on property insurance, but there's property insurance, there's life insurance, um, and, and uh, various different types of life insurance. Let's start with the property side of things, because we're talking about real estate, and we talked about this in the last couple of weeks, uh, and, and it's, it's real time with any deal that somebody is looking at purchasing. Uh, the property insurance on a property today for the buyer is not the same as the property insurance for the seller. The seller may say, hey, my property insurance is $2,500 a year. I don't have any claims. The roof doesn't leak. I haven't had any problems. And then that'll be your cost. And then the answer to that is absolutely 100% not uh, because I have to go back to the market and uh, there's very few players. And I have to insure it based on today's replacement value, which could be three, four times what you have it insured for. Uh, and then my insurance is a completely different number. 
And so uh, you, you, people need to understand that. Um, I, I know we keep talking about it. Paul's still, uh, you know, brooding in the studio that uh, his home insurance doubled. Uh, and I say, look, you're fortunate that it didn't triple. I mean, it, it, it could have been up that high. And so when you talk about the insurance world in general, there are fewer players. Uh, everybody is sort of gun shy. The costs have gone through the roof. And then I think that relates back to, you know, people's perception of other types of life insurance uh, in general. And so how do you mix the life insurance piece in with these other forms of investments when you're advising people on a total plan? That's important. I mean, you, when you're referencing preliminarily that property casualty side, um, yeah, it's a tough market. I think in my 24 years in business, one of the most challenging markets I've, I've seen uh, in, in both respect of there being fewer players in the marketplace and then those who remain, you know, charging a premium. And the challenge is <laughs> you're going to pay, right? You have, you have no right. Choice. And you have very few choices. <laughs> so so that's that's something that you have to consider. Um, that's where I like working with brokers, to be frank, because anytime you go to a specific carrier, if you don't fit in their box, if you don't meet the parameters of what they're looking for, they either, you know, decline you or just charge you a exorbitant rate. And, and you might think that's your only option. So, you know, I, I definitely encourage people to look and shop that around and, and find a firm that has the ability to look at different markets. For you, that's important. As relates to the life insurance side specifically, that doesn't have the same level of variance. I mean, again, 24 years in this business, I've sold thousands, tens of thousands of dollars of policies, billions of dollars in face amount. And and I, I what I do like about life insurance is it's absolute, right? <laughs> right. At the end of the day, somebody's getting paid. Yeah. It's not you're, you. You're <laughs> it's, it's a morbid joke that I tell, but it's the only form of insurance you buy that I guarantee you'll use. Yeah, right? like, someone will use, right? None, none, none of us are getting out of here alive, right? And so when you look, but even in that market, you have to look at different carriers. Not all carriers look at all ailments the same way. So if I've got someone who's overweight or has diabetes, right, cancer, or who's younger, older, all these things come into play to the, to the market and what I would look at, you know, in, in, in structuring, you know, a solution for a client. And, and, I, and I would say, look, it, it, it is a, uh, an important and integral part of any overall financial plan, no matter how much money you have or what you're doing. At, at the same time, you can't break your own cash flow to do it. Yeah, yeah. And there's different models. I think we talked about offline that uh, premium finance has grown in popularity over the years, whereby you can take uh, a loan from a bank and let the bank pay the life insurance premium for you and you only pay interest on the money, right? So insurance at its constant form is already leverage. Premium finance then is leverage on leverage. So what's better than you paying a dollar, right? For $10 of, of coverage is borrowing the dollar from the bank. Right. Pay the, the premium for $10. Right. And, and that, right? and that strategy I think really is more prevalent for high net worth and ultra high net worth individuals. Yeah. Yeah. It's pre a risky deal. Um, yeah. For pre sure. Pre pre premium finance. It's not so much riskier per se, but premium finance is not a way for people to get insurance who otherwise couldn't afford it. Premium finance is structured for people who could afford to pay the premium, but understand the value of leverage and wanting to use their dollars for other things, real estate, equities, you know, putting into their business, what have you. But obviously you're adding in another layer of, of, of complexity there when you're, when you're doing that. So again, my whole thing and, and the way I run my practice is give people the information to make educated decisions. When you understand how things work and, and please believe it, there's pros and cons to everything. There's no free lunch. Then you could decide, okay, what feels the best for you, what's right for you, and then choose accordingly. But um, you can't win a game if you don't know the rules of the game. And so I love what you're doing and this essentially sharing people with people here. Here's the lay of the land and what's available to you. Yeah. And you know, on the life insurance side, I mean, you can do low cost term insurance. You can do whole life. You can do universal. Certainly the premium finance would be the, the upper end of things, but it's a piece of that entire uh, financial strategy, if you will, that at the end of the day, you have to do something if you're trying to take care of whoever's going to be left around when you're gone. Yep. So, uh, so we have the insurance piece, uh, we have the real estate piece, we have the equities piece. I guess I talk about the cash piece, right? So what do I do with my money? Now, all of my buddies that are in the real estate world are asking that question because they're trying to buy real estate. But as we already talked about, it's very difficult to buy a property that makes a lot of sense today. So they're sitting on cash. Yeah. 
Um, there's one strategy as we pivot into the cash flow too that would be really valuable for people to know um, if you haven't heard of this strategy called a, a, a deferred sales trust. And essentially deferred sales trust is, is akin to section 453 of the IRS tax code, uh, seller carryback. So we're pretty familiar with that. I wanna buy your property. Uh, maybe I don't have, I can't secure bank financing. Maybe you don't want all the money up front anyway. So you carry the paper for me and I pay the, the an installment payment to you. So a deferred sales trust is essentially a conduit between the buyer and the seller that allows you to sell a property, put the proceeds in this deferred trust, uh, deferred sales trust and defer all the capital gains. So similar to like a, what's like a 1031, right? In real estate, except 1031s have their limitations, right? You need to identify the property in 45 days. You need to close in 180 days. And to your point, maybe I can sell the property and get this cash today, but one, I have to pay the tax and two, where am I going? So right. I like that strategy. If you do want to exit your property, you do want to sell a top dollar, but you're not quite sure when and where you want to go. Maybe your real estate you know, a guy or gal and you want to get back in, you're just not sure when. So the, the beauty with the interest rates being where they are right now is that you could just use fixed income, you know, fixed income, treasuries, thing they're being able over paying over 5%. It takes a village, right? To have a, a quote unquote, you know, great team. You need to have a great investment advisor, a great insurance broker, both life insurance, commercial, you need a great business attorney, you need a great estate planning attorney, accountant, all these things. And so that's what I have. I have one of my 12 companies is a company called Taylor Business Management. I'm essentially helping clients run their own mini family office. You've got your everyday consumer that's just kind of getting by. Maybe they buy a term life insurance policy and they buy a Roth IRA through Robinhood. They've got the other end of the, the spectrum, the ultra high net worth. I'm with four or 500 million. My accountant only works for me. My investment advisor only works for me. They got this, what I call the middle market, right? I'm worth, you know, maybe somewhere between a million and 20 million. So I certainly need more intention, right? And, and thoughtfulness than just, you know, a, a, a plan and a pat on the backside. But at the same Time, I'm not shelling out six figure salaries for people to watch my stuff. And so I, I work with people on all ranks of that spectrum. And, and I, I say, I want to meet people where they're at, right? If you're just starting out, okay, what do you need to do? If you're ultra high net worth, what do you need to do? You need to do. But most of us find ourselves somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And I'm guessing one of those 12 companies is a therapy company, right? Because part of it <laughs> is really understanding somebody's uh, goals and objectives, but then also understanding family requirements and drama and other things that are uh, both uh, financial and mental strain, which relates back to, in many instances, the money at the end of the day. Yeah, I've got a I've got a reality series coming out this summer called Mind, Body, Money. You guys can look it up, mindbodymoney.com. And I speak to the power of positive thought, mindset, body, health, and wellness, right? And good stewardship of money, right? And so we're all on this journey, but that's one thing that I've witnessed, witnessed in, again, 24 years, no matter whether it's real estate, you know, whether it's law, whether it's, you know, we all, professional athletes, we're all on this journey trying to become the best versions of ourselves. And, and that's what it's about. Positive mindset, taking care of ourselves and money and, 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 and no matter what industry you, you want to reference, I can tell you a story. Anyone who's great, anyone who's self-made, well, I'll tell you somebody who's been down on their luck, right? You know, fallen down, stumbled, gotten back up and, and continue to fight. You know, winners are, lo are just losers who try one more time. Right. And, and so I love, I love life. I love people. I love connecting. I love helping. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and, and basically I'm just an educator. I'm a Sherpa. I'm just helping people guide people based on their needs. And so, uh, uh, it's been a journey, right. And, uh, at, at, at 46 years old doing this for 24 years, I've officially been in this business longer than I have not been in this business. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then one day you wake up and you go, geez, I'm old. And that was, me yeah, last week, you know, right? you wake up there, but you know, I've got, I've got, I got four daughters, 17 years old is my oldest 14 year old twins. I have a baby. Actually, her birthday is today. She's one. Ah, well, happy so, birthday. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I had a starter marriage and, uh, my three olders and daughters and got back on the horse. I was around in second and got back up to bat. So my, my running joke is that I used to pray to God. And he sent girls to hang all over me. He took me literally. and was like, here you go. So I've got, I got four of them, but, but the new baby one years old, I'm not, I can't quit anytime soon. Right. So, uh, Got to, got to keep working. So this has been a, a great journey and, and I love the opportunity to help people and enrich their lives and, and make a living doing so. It's a, truly a win-win. Good. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show and, and sharing your thoughts and your insight with us. If people want to find out more information about uh, your company, where would they go? What's the website? Yeah, it's Taylor, T-A-Y-L-O-R-I-N-S for insurance, F-I-N for financial.com. So 
uh, Taylor, I-N-S-F-I-N.com. I'm all over social media. I have uh, recent articles in Forbes, Business Insider, um, Men's Health, um, um, Newsweek. So I'm across the across the board. You can look me up at eSelfie Taylor. My name's unique. Think of a selfie like you're taking a photo. Put an E in front. eSelfie. That's E S Z Y L F like Frank I E eSelfie Taylor. Just put me in Google. I'm really easy to find. Certainly open to help and communicate with anybody that reaches out um, and, uh, and and be a blessing. So thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, well, I appreciate you coming on. It's Selfie Taylor, uh, a man of many hats and a man of many daughters. And so thanks for your insight. I'm Barry Saywitz, uh, president of the Saywitz Company. Uh, it's been lots of fun. We will see you back here next week. I want to thank all the folks here at OC Talk Radio helping us put on the show every week. And uh, we will see you back here next week on Let's Talk Real Estate. There you have it. You've been listening to Let's Talk Real Estate, your weekly BS with Barry Saywitz about the current state of the real commercial real estate market right here in Southern California. On Orange County's only community radio station, OC Talk Radio, streaming live from our studio here at the University of California Irvine's Beale Applied Innovation Center.